Hello, welcome to God's Big Picture, where we are tracing the story of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, as we see how the one story of God's plan to save the world through Jesus unfolds. Today, we look at Genesis chapter 17, under the title, The Promised Kingdom. Let's dive in and see what happens. In the story of the Bible so far, we have seen that in Genesis 1 and 2, God made a perfect world and God created man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. In Genesis 2, verse 16, we read that God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. What we saw in just the next chapter, that is Genesis 3, under the title of the perished kingdom, is that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and did exactly what God told them not to do. The result of their disobedience is that God pronounces judgment on them and sent them out from the Garden of Eden. We however noted that Genesis 3 is not all doom and gloom. Despite their sin, God still loves them. He comes looking for them and then provides clothes for them to hide their nakedness. God's love and grace is seen above all in a promise he makes in Genesis 3 verse 15, where God says, I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This might seem only a hint of what will happen, but one thing is very encouraging. In making this promise, God is pointing to a time in the future when a son of Eve a human being will destroy the evil one and we will see this fulfilled in Jesus who defeated Satan through his death on the cross. What we see from Genesis 3 is that God keeps his word and grace is seen in the way he deals with different people. Just in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, when Cain kills his brother Abel, God punishes him but he also places a protective mark on Cain and promises that anyone who kills him will himself be judged. Again, in Genesis 5, we see in the genealogy with that depressing refrain that we saw last time, and then he died, and then he died, that in verse 24, one man by the name Enoch doesn't die. God is gracious to him. And thus we are told, Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. Here we are given, the hope that even in a fallen world, it's possible to know God and escape the penalty of death. In Genesis chapter 6 to 9, we see how sin increased and God judges the wickedness of man by setting the flood. But even in the midst of this judgment, one man by the name of Noah fights grace in the eyes of the Lord, as we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. Noah, together with his family, are saved from the flood. Just a few chapters later, after the waters of the flood go down, we see God making another promise saying, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be flood to destroy the earth. Having made his promise, God puts a sign in the sky, a rainbow. Whenever he sees it in the future, he will remember his commitment to creation. And whenever we see it, we are to take comfort. You see, in every episode, in the early chapters of Genesis, after the fall, we have noticed that the three elements of sin, judgment, and grace are there. But one of them is not there in Genesis 11, on that account of the Tower of Babel. Sin and judgment are both there, as the people build the tower and then are scattered and divided one from another. But there is no sign of God's grace. We have to wait until the next chapter in the Bible to see what happens. We thus come to Genesis 12, where we see God appearing to Abraham and promises to reverse the effects of the judgment that God made after Babel. In this chapter, God declares his intention to bring Abraham back and all the scattered people of the world, and that he's going to bless them once more. Listen to what God says to Abraham in these beautiful verses of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you, and I'll make of you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, 
and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. Beautiful words, aren't they? One important thing to note here is that there was nothing special about Abraham. He was chosen not because of his goodness, but because of God's grace alone. In these verses, we see three main elements the promises God gave to Abraham, which are people, blood, and blessing. Let's see how each of these unfolds. The first one, people. Abraham's descendants would become a great nation that would be God's own people. This is later underlined in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, when God says, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The promise is frequently repeated in throughout the Old Testament in the covenant refrain, I will be your God and you will be my people. The second promise is Lord. Abraham is commanded to leave his homeland and to go to another land that God will show him. This is Canaan, the promised land. God says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. The bad promise that God gives to Abraham is that of his blessing. God promises Abraham that his descendants will be blessed. And through them, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Here we see that the curse of the fall will be replaced by the blessing of salvation. Right from the start, God's plan of salvation was universal. It involved all nations. Abraham thus becomes the father of a multitude. Now, we must note that it, it must have been hard for Abraham to believe that all this would take place. But the Bible clearly tells us that he did believe in God's promises. In Genesis 15 verse 6, we read that Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham was accepted by God, not on the basis of his own goodness, but by the faith in the promises of God. That has always been the way of salvation for sinful human beings like you and I. We can never deserve a place in God's family. Our only hope is to trust in the gospel. It is the same for us it, as it was for Abraham. As we shall see in the next video, the gospel that was first proclaimed to Abraham was partially fulfilled in the history of Israel in the promised land of Canaan. But the same gospel has now and fully full been fulfilled in the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He, that is Abraham, and those from all nations who trust in Jesus are God's people. And we can look forward to enjoying the fullness of God's blessing, not on earth, but in heaven, the new Jerusalem. So, you and I can long for that day when our faith will be made to sight, when we, together with Abraham and all God's people, will live together with Abraham days without end, under God, under his rule, and under his blessing. May we long for this day. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time as we continue with God's big picture.